This video is brought to you by Sailing World and SailingWorld.com. Stuart Strolley with Sailing World Magazine, standing here with Paul Kayar, the CEO of Artemis Racing. Paul, give us your assessment of the team's performance yesterday. A tough break, it seemed, in the semifinals of the Match Racing Championship. Yeah, we um, made a mistake, really, in the, in the first race. We, we led both starts, so Terry did a great job on the execution of the starts in the first race at the first jibe, which is really one of the criti critical junctures in the race because usually the boats are close, trailing boats right behind the leading boat, and that they'll always jibe simultaneously, and if the lead boat makes any mistake at all, it's a great opportunity for the trailing boat to pass, which is the design of the race course. Uh, and we got a knot in our uh, new Jenniker sheet, and that prevented them from trimming it on, and we got rolled by energy there, and, you know, they're good sailors going fast, and it, and even though we did make a little comeback on the second beat, um, they hung on to win. Second race, we uh, really had the bad luck you're speaking about because we were leading and did that first jibe. The execution of the jibe was perfect, but there was a, you know, a little hole in the wind there right where we were, and when the wind refilled, it filled from the windward side and kind of just took the energy boat. Uh, in, in essence, their, their distance behind became an advantage because the puff hit them that much sooner and took them over the front of us. And, Again, it was hard to pass them. Um, both French teams have made a great improvement in this regatta, and largely because of the skill of the helmsmen that are now sailing those boats. Both boats have changed helmsmen since uh, Plymouth, and it's noticeable in the results. Just one mistake. Uh, you're out of the semifinals, onto the battle for third or fourth. Sailors are used to longer series, more chances to come back, whether it's in a longer race or in a longer three out of five, four out of seven series. Is this a, a fair way to decide who, who the best team is going into the event? Well, um, I guess it's fair because each team has exactly the same chance to win even just one race. So um, is it a true test? Is it an accurate representation of the skill levels of the teams? Probably debatable. You know, we're used to long series, as you said, but also the 100-meter final in the Olympics is one race, you know, and if you trip or false start or anything that you do wrong there, you know, there goes maybe a lifetime worth of training. So, um, the, you know, the line has to be drawn somewhere, and uh, two out of three is, is a good measure. Paul, you recently fired what many consider to be the first legal volley in the 34th America's Cup, an inquiry into the relationship between Luna Rosa and Emirates Team New Zealand. Tell us what's behind that filing. Well, really what's behind it, Stuart, is just uh, we're seeking clarification on what is allowed by the protocol and, and what isn't. And I guess it's fair to say that our understanding of what's allowed isn't exactly the same as what is being purported by Grant Dalton and the media. Of course, we're not privy to the actual agreement, so there may be a discrepancy there also. So really we're at a point where we just simply have to ask for clarification and um, depending on the answers, we may um, adjust our, our program as may Oracle or any of the other competitors. So um, it's really that and we're firing it off early as soon as we became aware of the, of the uh, planned uh, collaboration just in case there is something that they're planning to do that maybe isn't allowed um, they can modify without too much of a financial impact which would be great. I mean we, we really are happy to have Prada involved. They've been involved uh, for our, three America's Cups already. They're a great competitor, and certainly we are happy to have more competitors in the America's Cup, but we just need to understand what footing we're all competing on, and that's all. It's a clarification. How difficult is it for you? You are the challenger of record. However, you didn't write many of the challenger of record rules, which, which puts you, I guess, in an interesting spot of being somewhat responsible for them, but not necessarily knowing how they came about. Yeah, actually, I'm happy to hear you uh, put that question to me because in some of the media recently since we did f lodge the application to the jury uh, just I think 48 hours ago you know uh, numerous uh, not numerous but a few have said well geez uh, why is Artemis Racing and Oracle filing this uh, clarification they wrote the protocol well in fact Artemis did not write the protocol you're right we we came into it after most of this was written and um, so it's a little unfair to say that we wrote the protocol um, and um, yeah, we, you know, it's, it's all, there's a lot to it. I, I don't really want to go into the details of the case, um, but uh, it's just part of business. We just got to clarify and everybody understands where we're at. I think it'll be good for both Product Team New Zealand as well as all the other competitors to have it aired out. 
You mentioned doing some training with Oracle uh, once you guys have launched your 72. It sounds like you're going to sail it a little bit in Valencia, then take it over to San Francisco to finish off the remaining 30 days that you have allotted to sail that boat. What's the relationship between you and Oracle? Is it more of a simple handshake, we'll go out and race against each other, or is there something more complex? Right now it's just that. It's just, yeah, let's go out and ra race. Um, we're talking about possibly, you know, making it a little bit more formal. Maybe there can be an event um, like the Moet Cups were a, f a, f a few years ago in San Francisco. Um, and there's no talk of exchanging data. Now, I think we could, we could tele put telemetry on both those boats and exchange the data. Um, of course, neither of us is privy to the other's design, so, um, you know. But at this point, it's just a handshake, and we want to be in San Francisco to experience those conditions next summer. And they're obviously based in San Francisco, so it's just logical that we would sail. Yeah. Right now, uh, this team, I notice you have a bunch of suppliers, some of them behind them here. No uh, major sponsors, no title sponsor. Is that something you're searching for? And if so, how goes the search? Well, we're definitely searching for corporate partners, and the search is tough. It's, it's difficult out there, but we um, are you know, working on it. We have a sponsorship department. We're making some contacts. and. Um, I think these events, these AC45 events, are great for showcasing the new America's Cup and um, what a powerful um, sports marketing tool it can be. And so we're, we're working on it, and I'm sure we will have corporate partners. How tough, if we go back to, to 87 when Dennis went, went down under, took the cup back, I think anyone who saw that cup remembers the Budweiser Spinnaker. Mm -hmm. He had a, a great relationship with corporate America and the corporate powers that we know that are sports backers, whether they be cars or beer or liquor. Is it, is it, why is it more difficult to convince those partners to come on board now than it, than it was back then? Um, well, probably the ask is bigger and um, you know, there's a couple of things. The America's Cup has had a, a little bit of a rough patch with um, the last few events and the events of the 33rd America's Cup. And you've got that combined with a world economy that's tighter and tougher and there's more scrutiny on sponsorships for corporations. You know, they really have to, marketing managers really need to justify a sponsorship in terms of ROI. You know, are they going to sell more cars or more computers based on a relationship. So um, I think it's the, the combi combination of both of those uh, factors that makes it a tough market. But I think we have a much better product. So what it, what it, what's important here is to get this new America's Cup out, exposed to the public and to the corporate world. And um, I think we have something better to offer them. And once they see it, I think they'll agree. Looking at the 72, you guys are going to build, will that be the first of two boats? Um, yes, we plan to build two boats. How does the 45 circuit help you in terms of research and development? These boats are one design, so you're very limited in what you can change. What are you learning from this circuit that you'll be able to apply forward to the 72 design? Um, well, I think one of the interesting things we're learning is how physical these boats are, what the physical demand is, and it's kind of a good balance because uh, there's always a tendency in the America's Cup to get pretty complicated and tricky and you know do enor enormous amounts of R&D to try to reach an ultimate speed of the machine but um, racing where you never go straight for more than two minutes um, and where people's heart rates are running at about 90 percent of max anyway it kind of also teaches you wow simplicity has a value here and so um, I think that it's, it's showing us that, it's showing us also just what it is to match race multi-hulls, you know, and how vulnerable they are, for example, on that first jibe. You know, there's such a big change in velocity of the boat. The boat has no mass, so it has no inertia through a jibe, it just simply stops. And then it has to rebuild that apparent wind speed and, re and then it really accelerates, but there's a moment when the boat's extremely vulnerable. So understanding how that fits into a strategy is important too. Vulnerable because at the moment you're going slow, all of a sudden the apparent wind is from behind, and that's where someone can can grab your wind, or simply what what is the vulnerability based on? Yeah, it's a little bit of that, but it's more that a, a maneuver costs so much, and so um, if at the time you are slow, um, that slow period gets prolonged. It's a much bigger, a bad tack and a. Um, in a version five boat, maybe the boat slow, when the boat would tack, it would slow down 
from max speed. And so if it stayed slow for an extra 15 seconds while you got whatever problem sorted out, um, you know, so you were going 15% slow for 15 seconds, whatever that is. Here, the boat slows to a third of its top end speed in the maneuver, maybe even a quarter. So, you know, it's a 75% drop in its speed. So if you drop your speed by 75% for 15 seconds, I mean, it's easy to do the math. That's a lot more expensive. So that's what I mean. When you're in that slow zone, it's really important to fly the hull, reaccelerate, and get the thing back on track. Um, and that's where the vulnerability is. When you go to the 72, you'll have to expand the crew. You'll need 11 people to sail these boats. What sort of sailors are you looking to fill that out? Are you going to go raid the U.S. crew team for some guys who can, who can, you know, erg scores off the charts, or will you be looking for more experienced cup sailors? Well, we've um, gone down the path of experienced cup sailors so far. Um, we are going to bring a few, let's say, athletes on board, not without sailing experience, but, but it, it's sailors that are having a very athletic profile and um, because of the, yeah it's very physical so where we haven't filled out the team yet now we probably think we have quite a lot of experience on the team so where we haven't where we have spaces available the emphasis is probably going to be on physical fitness all right so get in the gym any cup sailors if you're interested in sailing in the next america's cup paul thank you very much for your time and good luck the rest of the way thank you Stuart.